With its distinctive 60s pop art cover, a collection of Beatles oldies is one of the most recognisable of all the Beatles' original albums. Released in nearly every country from Argentina to Australia and even behind the Iron Curtain, this album held the torch for the true sound of Beatlemania for more than 20 years before being dumped and disowned by their record company and, dare I say it, by many collectors too. In this video, I'll tell you the untold story of this album and how important it was to millions of fans around the world and why it deserves to be celebrated today. I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions and welcome to the story of a collection of Beatles oldies. But gold is. By the end of summer 1966, the Beatles had had enough. In just four crazy years, they'd gone from having a ball playing a smelly cramped cellar in Liverpool to being performing puppets in front of 25,000 people in a baseball stadium, unable to hear themselves. As they touched down at Heathrow Airport on August the 31st, their final US tour completed, many, including the Beatles themselves, thought it was all over. Although the Beatles seemed at ease with their decision to stop touring, for their manager Brian Epstein, his worst nightmare had just come true. For a man who thrived on organising the group's concerts and tours, their decision to stop was a devastating blow. It was certainly a factor which contributed to his accidental overdose of prescription drugs in late September 1966. The press, in the wake of John's solo jaunt to Spain to film How I Won the War, George's solo trip to India and Paul's work on the Family Way soundtrack began to circulate rumours of a split. At one point, these rumours became so persistent that Brian Epstein had to drag himself from his bed at the clinic where he was recuperating to deny that Paul McCartney was leaving the group. The Sunday Telegraph magazine even reported that Epstein himself was about to be replaced by someone called Alan Klein. Another party keeping a close eye on the situation was the Beatles record company, EMI. Christmas was easily the most profitable time of the year for them, and they desperately needed an LP for Santa to put under the tree. The new Beatles album had always been the most popular Christmas gift for fans, many of who just couldn't afford to buy one for themselves. In 1963, it had been with the Beatles. In 1964, it was Beatles for sale. And at Christmas 1965, there'd been Rubber Soul. It was EMI's marketing manager, Roy Featherston, who came up with the answer, a greatest hits compilation album. Unlike some countries such as Germany and Australia, EMI UK had so far resisted the temptation to put out such an album, but now was the perfect time. Convinced that it would be the best-selling Beatles album ever, a track listing of 16 songs was finalised and the EMI machine went into action. Think about it, an album full of million selling songs. How on earth could it fail? When informed of the plan, the Beatles were immediately against it. But as they had no new material to offer at that point, and were obliged under contract to produce two albums a year, there wasn't anything they could do to stop it. With the track listing finalised, the next task was to prepare the tapes. As usual, the album would be made available in both mono and stereo formats. Compiling the mono version would be easy, but the stereo version was another matter. The main issue was that a number of the chosen tracks had only ever been released in mono, therefore stereo mixes had to be created from scratch. Such was the hubris of George Martin and his team, just four mixing sessions lasting a couple of hours each were booked between October the 31st and November the 10th. But what George Martin thought would be a breeze turned out to be one of his most challenging tasks to date. The first two-hour stereo mixing session took place on October the 31st. The plan was to mix three songs into stereo, those being Paperback Writer, I Want to Hold Your Hand and She Loves You. However, by the time they'd done three stereo mixes of Paperback Writer, time was up and the other two tracks were put on the shelf for the next day. That day turned out to be November the 7th, but this time the session lasted three hours. Martin began where he left off the week before with stereo mixing for I Want to Hold Your Hand. The track had actually already been mixed for stereo twice before, first in October 1963 and then again in June 1965, but Martin felt he could do better this time. 
that June 1965 mix had been shipped out to Australia for inclusion on their Greatest Hits album in June 1966. The original 1963 stereo mix had lain on the shelf for 13 years, before it bizarrely turned up on a reissue single in Australia in 1976. Once again, Martin had spent all of the session on this one track, and plans to remix She Loves You and From Me To You that day were dropped. For some unknown reason, Martin didn't attend the third stereo mixing session the next day, leaving Jeff Emmerich to face the album's biggest challenge alone, creating a stereo mix for the opening track, She Loves You. The problem was that no one could find the original twin track tape for the song, but it wasn't long before they realised that it had been junked by EMI back in 1963. So it was now up to Jeff Emmerich to create a mock stereo mix from the mono tape. Whereas Capital had this process down to a fine, if flawed art, the process was relatively uncommon at EMI at the time. If an album or track was never recorded in stereo, it just went out in mono. Simple. But this was the Beatles. Creating stereo from mono back in 1966 was a crude process, which involved just some basic equalisation. The high frequencies were boosted and fed to the left channel at the same time the bass was cut on the left. Then the lows were boosted and fed to the right channel, with a cut in the highs on that right channel feed. It sounds crude today, but back in the 1960s, the record companies drove the engineers to exaggerate these effects to the max, and the result sounded truly awful. In addition to that, the generational tape loss caused by copying created a veil over the sound, which dulled the quality of the original. Emmerich made two stereo mixes that day, but despite his best efforts, the result ended up being easily the worst sounding stereo mix in the entire Beatles UK catalogue. Again, they'd underestimated the time these things take, and the planned remix of From Me To You never happened. The fourth and final mixing session took place on November the 10th. George Martin was again absent, as was Jeff Emmerich, his ears probably still smarting from the previous session. This session was led by EMI balance engineer Peter Brown, assisted by his colleague Graeme Kirkby. EMI's doomed plan to sweeten the album for fans who already had everything else on it was the shoehorn in the track Bad Boy, which despite having appeared on the US Beatles 6 album back in June 1965, had yet to be released in the UK. But due to a miscommunication on the telephone between Abbey Road and EMI HQ in Manchester Square, Brown and Kirkby spent the first part of the session mixing this boy for stereo instead of Bad Boy. By the time the error was discovered a few days later, it was too late to remix the track, and the original mix which had been made for the US on May the 19th, 1965, had to be used instead. The second song mixed that day was Day Tripper, which replaced the earlier mix prepared on October the 26th, 1965, which eventually turned up on the US album Yesterday and Today, and Greatest Hits Volume 2 in Australia. We Can Work It Out was the final track to be mixed for stereo for this album, and replaced the mix which was made on November the 19th, 1965, which also ended up on Yesterday and Today, but was later scrapped by EMI on August the 9th, 1966. Fortunately for both Martin and Emmerich, twin or four track tapes existed for all the other tracks needed, and these were balanced quickly and without fuss. Bad Boy aside, out of the album's other 15 tracks, just two, Yesterday and Michelle, had not been released as singles in the UK. Yesterday had been coupled with Dizzy Miss Lizzy for DP 563 in July 1965, and Michelle with Drive My Car as DP 564 one year later in July 1966. Now let's turn to this album's most recognisable feature, its distinctive cover artwork. As I mentioned earlier, it was no secret that the Beatles were against this album from the start. But was it possible that they tried to sabotage it by refusing to have their images on the front cover? We don't know for sure, but Brian Epstein ended up commissioning young British artist David Christian to come up with a design for the front cover. Following on in a similar vein to Revolver, which was also illustration based and still selling well at this time, Christian came up with this vibrant pop art design which captured the spirit of the fashion boutiques of Carnaby Street and the retro vibe of London, which was still in full swing. The Beatles themselves appear only on the rear panel, in a candid shot taken by Robert Whittaker inside their room at the Tokyo Hilton Hotel on June the 30th. Although no one in the UK noticed, Whittaker's photo was actually printed in reverse, 
but the Japanese did from the script on Paul's kimono, and they switched the image on their covers. The album was finally released on December 10, 1966, although its appearance in the shops did little to quell the breakup rumours, especially as no Beatles were to be seen promoting it or doing anything else. But what the press and public didn't know was that they were already hard at work in Abbey Road, laying down tracks which would eventually produce Sgt Pepper six months later. EMI had naively been expecting Oldies to be the biggest album of the year, but that turned out to be one of their biggest miscalculations, in the UK at least. In a chart dominated by the year's biggest selling album, The Sound of Music, and the pretenders to their pop idol crown The Monkeys, a collection of Oldies peaked at only number seven. It was even outperformed by compilations by two of their biggest rivals, the Rolling Stones' big hits High Tide and Green Grass and the best of the Beach Boys. One of the reasons for the album's lacklustre performance was simply that many fans just refused to buy it. They felt cheated, and justifiably so. After all, they'd spent three years buying all of the Beatles' records, and here they were being asked to fork out a mighty £1 and 12 shillings for one track. Not likely. The album marked a clear dividing line in the Beatles' musical career, and for many of the fans who'd been with them since 1963, it stopped here. The album became just a casual purchase for the curious record buyer, who'd maybe never bought a Beatles record before, and probably wouldn't do so again. So instead of being the Christmas present every Beatles fan wanted in 1966, it became the album every Beatles fan gave to their grandparents. The critics didn't help either, slamming EMI's commercial motivation. But whilst the album would forever be branded as a throwaway failure in the UK, its significance in other parts of the world cannot be overstated. And one of those places was behind the Iron Curtain. If you were a Beatles fan in, say, East Germany or Czechoslovakia in the 1960s, there was very little chance that you would have ever seen, let alone owned, a real Beatles record. As we saw in a previous video on this channel about Czechoslovakia, the communist regime in some Eastern Bloc countries was extremely strict, and pop music was tightly controlled. The Beatles' music was to be heard only as covers by local artists. But in the wake of the Prague Spring in 1968, the communist authorities in Czechoslovakia, anxious to prevent further instability, placated the youth by releasing a real Beatles album, and this was the one they chose. Released in 1969, a collection of oldies was available on the state-run Superfun label, in both stereo and mono. The mono being just a fold-down of the stereo. Those who could afford it were now able to enjoy the Beatles' music legally and without fear for the first time. They could even read about it too, with this specially written insert, which was included in each copy. This Yugoslavian pressing was renamed Hits of the Beatles, presumably because it was easier to understand than the UK title. It was released more or less in sync with the UK issue in early 1967, and contains true mono versions of every track. The album was also released in East Germany, where it appeared on their state-run record label Amiga in January 1974, in stereo only. This pressing came in a modified cover, which carried a lengthy essay on the rear panel, which praised the Beatles for promoting the ideas of socialism in the West. It was also available as a cassette too, which unlike the UK edition, managed to keep the tracks in the original running order. The late 60s and early 70s were incredibly bleak times in these Eastern Bloc countries, and this album must have seen like a ray of sunshine for pop fans who'd spent the 60s being starved of the Beatles and their music. During the five years I spent in Prague in the late 1990s, many people who were young in the late 60s and early 70s told me how much this album had meant to them, and how it had even helped them to learn English. It was truly an album to be cherished and guarded with your life, as this copy obviously was. Mint unplayed copies just don't exist. I'm sure the same could be true for East Germans, not to mention fans in other parts of the world, for whom this album was a gateway into the Beatles' music, long before the Red and the Blue albums. Of course, this album was a huge success worldwide, and here are just some of those pressings from around the world. <laughs> 
The notable exception to this list was Capitol in the US, who showed no interest in releasing the album stateside or indeed any other Beatles Greatest Hits package. But in the US, Greatest Hits albums were usually reserved for bands whose careers were at an end, and the labels wanted to squeeze the last few drops of revenue from their catalogue before they disappeared into oblivion. It's something that Capitol had done to the Beach Boys earlier that year, when on hearing Pet Sounds for the first time, thought that the group were done, and hastily issued the best of the Beach Boys two months later, effectively killing Pet Sounds stone dead. However, the album did become one of the first UK Beatles albums to be imported into the US in late 1967, early 1968, and gave US fans their first opportunity to hear the reverb-free I Feel Fine and help without that wacky James Bond intro. In fact, according to a December 1971 report in Billboard on the preference for UK-pressed albums amongst LA record buyers, a collection of Beatles' oldest was one of the most popular imported titles. The reasons for its popularity in the US were twofold. Firstly, that it contains 16 tracks, instead of the 11 on the original Capitol albums. Secondly, were the mixes. It must have been mind-blowing after years of listening to Dave Dexter mixes to suddenly be hearing true, clear stereo mixes of From Me To You or Hard Day's Night for the first time. The album remained a steady seller in the UK throughout the 1970s. Not just on vinyl, but on cassette and even 8-track too. Its slow death began in 1976, when the rock and roll music album stole its thunder by including Bad Boy amongst its track list. By the early 1980s, it was looking very dated, and was demoted to EMI's recently rebranded MFP budget label, called Fame, in July 1983. The final nail in the coffin came with the introduction of the CD, after which it was unceremoniously deleted in 1987 to make way for the past Masters compilations. However, there was one last pressing in 1984, which was the first copy of this album that I ever owned. It came in the form of this double album, issued in conjunction with a superb magazine series published by Orbis called The History of Rock. This album was part of a series of 40 double albums, covering popular music from 1956 to the present day. It was a superb, intelligently compiled series of albums, expertly curated by Bob Fisher, one of the industry's most highly regarded catalogue experts, who sadly passed away just a short time ago, on October the 7th, 2021. As a music-hungry teenager, I ate up the entire series, and it provided me with a wonderful musical education, for which I am truly grateful. Thanks, Bob. Back in the early 1980s, licensing Beatles music was difficult, but not as impossible as it is nowadays, and the Beatles eventually appeared on volume 26. In fact, it was the only Beatles musical product released between Real Music in 1982 and Past Masters in 1988. The double album was basically a repackage of two existing albums, Live at the Hollywood Bowl and a collection of oldies, both of which sounded really good. Talking of sound quality, what does the original album sound like, and is there a best sounding pressing? Let's find out. I've said a number of times on this channel that I think this is the worst sounding album in their original catalogue. Unusually for a UK first issue, both original mono and stereo pressings sound mushy and lack any real bite. This was mostly caused by the compromises which had to be made to fit eight songs onto each side. This meant rolling off the bass and top end, not to mention the addition of a heavy dose of compression during the cutting stage, all of which makes the album sound dull and lifeless. Some of the East European pressings, all of which were cut locally using tapes from EMI, actually sound better to my ears. However, there's still some magic left in there. For example, the wonderful mono mix of Yesterday and all the original single mixes, which are the real deal. The mono pressing disappeared in 1969, but the stereo pressing ran throughout the 1970s, but without any significant improvement in the sound quality along the way. In fact, it retained its original 1G matrix right up until it was finally recut in 1980. Ironically, it was the final pressing on the Fame label that sounded the best. 
it used a dash 5 dash 8 long matrix cut by Harry Moss, which finally manages to lift the veil of sludge from the sound and finally brought the tracks back to life. The same cutting was used on the History of Rock album, but being a limited pressing run on better quality vinyl, it's a shade better than the fame pressing. Whilst not being up to the quality of the Red Album, it's still the best sounding pressing of the album out there. I must also give an honourable mention to this Japanese pressing, which isn't bad either. As far as collectability and rarities go, it's not one which is at the top of most collectors' wants lists, even in its original first pressing format. Apart from the regular label design changes, it remained remarkably consistent throughout its life. The only significant variation of it I've ever come across is this change to the stereo information box on the rear panel. So that just leaves one final question. Why can't you go out and buy this album new today? One, or perhaps the most popular argument, is that all of these tracks are available on other releases. You could just as well burn a CD or make a playlist of the original track listing. But that's not the point, is it? This is an original UK Canon album. And despite it being disliked by the Beatles themselves, it was released in their lifetime and is, whether they like it or not, an official Beatles album. The success of most Beatles and 60s material being served up today by record companies relies heavily on its nostalgia appeal. Whether you're a first or second generation fan like me, I imagine that a lot of you have your own memories of buying or owning this album, which incidentally I'd love to hear about in the comments, and would buy a copy of this if it was available today. What a joy it would have been to have had this album included in the 2014 mono box set. Imagine how beautiful the reproduced cover with its original flipbacks would have been. The mono and stereo sets and indeed the entire 2021 Beatles catalogue are poorer for its absence. But listen Apple, it's not too late. If you can't justify its release as part of the canon, I think it would be a perfect candidate for at least a future Record Store Day release. So how about it? What dear viewer do you think? I know I'd buy it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give us a big thumbs up and maybe hit the subscribe button. Also, do check out our website, parlogramauctions.com for lots of great sounding, top quality Beatles vinyl from all around the world. If you'd like to see exclusive content and all our videos first, you could become a channel member, which ultimately helps me keep all of these videos coming. But that's all for this time, so I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.